The scripture reading this day from the Old Testament is from the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the righteous reign of the coming king. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling, tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And from Luke's Gospel this morning, the wonderful words in the first chapter of the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestors David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The gospel of our Lord praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. O Lord, as your word came long ago to Mary, let it speak to us this morning and help us to respond as she did with obedience and joy. What is the most incredible thing about this passage for you as you read and hear these familiar words this morning? What do you find most unbelievable or impossible in the reading and the hearing of this well-known story of Christ's birth announcement to Mary? Is it the angels or the moment of the Annunciation itself? An angel coming to earth to speak to a woman? Is it that a woman is honored as an agent of God's plan? Or is it the mystery of the Incarnation itself? And what is most incredible, or is what is most incredible to you simply that God comes to earth, that God wants to enter our lives, that God would even want to walk with us? 
Let's begin with the angels. The word for angel also means messenger. And yes, Virginia, there are angels. Biblical angels not only bring tidings and commandments, but they also act as rescuers, as guardians, as guides, as stern admonishers, as interpreters of visions. They can be warriors, destroyers, controllers of nature, and worshipers in the court of heaven. Angels appear in visions. Remember Jacob, seeing angels ascending and descending a ladder between heaven and earth. Or to Isaiah, who saw a six-winged seraph, seraphim, and to John in Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, They come in many forms, including in Revelation, four beasts full of eyes. When you stop to think about it, angels are so busy in the Bible that we almost stumble over them. Three dine with Abraham. Two rescue the family of Lot and Sodom. An angel or a celestial form nourishes Hagar in the wilderness. An angel from heaven calls to Abraham to stop the sacrifice of Isaac. With Jacob, an angel wrestles. One feeds and instructs Elijah. Another protects Daniel and his friends in the lion's den from the fiery furnace. When you stop to think about it, angels are here, there, and everywhere in the Bible. They are almost such busybodies that one wonders why at some point in the Bible, some character simply did not say to them, enough already. Angels advise Joseph in dreams, and they minister to Jesus after his temptation and during the agony on the cross. Angels roll the stone away from the tomb and announce the resurrection to the woman, women. In Hebrews, we're told that angels are devoted to the welfare of the heirs of salvation. And that's the point, because that includes you and me. We are the heirs of salvation. In 1 Peter, we learn that our redemption is a mystery that they desire to look into. And Luke reminds us that they rejoice over every sinner who repents. Psalm 91 declares that God shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You never know quite when or where you'll meet them. Angels sometimes adopt human form. Abraham and others fail at first to recognize that their visitors are heavenly. And the writer of Hebrew so wisely cautions us in our current time, do not forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. For years, there was a popular TV show called Touched by an Angel, that focused our intention on them. Do you expect to see any angels? Maybe you already have. Maybe you should look for one in the coming week. Did Mary expect to see angels? And yet we celebrate today for angels are a biblical truth for you and for me. Let's turn to the Annunciation. It's indescribable, but Thomas Merton, in his poem, his free-flowing poem, was to describe it this way. Fifteen years old, the flowers printed on her dress cease moving in the middle of her prayer when God, who sends the messenger, meets his messenger in her heart. Her answer, between breath and breath, Wings from her innocence are sacrament. In her white body, God becomes our bread. Our scripture this day reveals 
And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. Blessed are you among women. The poet A.E. Hausman was to write, How odd of God to choose the Jews. And how odd of God to choose a woman. And Mary, at that, to initiate the beginning of salvation. In the most important event of all history, the mighty male is excluded, passed over. It's a woman who is the agent of God's work in the world. And the chosen one is Mary, a young, frightened Jewish woman, a woman of no power or position in the world. Martin Luther put it well when he wrote, The true Christian religion does not begin at the top as other religions do. It begins at the bottom, with the lowly. The gospel of Jesus Christ begins with a lowly woman, the woman Mary. It begins with and ends with the women, once again, women at the tomb. Well, we've spoken about angels and the Annunciation. And what of the Incarnation itself? We read, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. What are, you, what are we to make of this incarnation? The Presbyterian minister Frederick Buechner was to write, There are mysteries which you can solve by thought, and there are other mysteries whose truth itself is the mystery. The more you try to fathom it, the more fathomless it is revealed to be. And so it is with the mystery of the Incarnation. We do not solve the mystery. We live the mystery. Because that's what Mary chose to do. Let it be to me according to your word, she says. And Mary's faithful response makes her the highest model of obedience to God. For the Incarnation is not only the work of the Trinity, it is the work and the will of faithful Mary, because she herself chose, chose to believe and obey God firmly. Imagine what would have happened if Mary had not said yes to God. And so now we begin to see that Christmas is not about getting what we want, but God giving us what God wants. God wanted to come to earth, and Mary opened her heart to receive the Lord. Good news of great joy. Beware, you powerful. Hope and rejoice, you powerless. This is the real message of Christmas. There are so many marvelous mysteries to ponder at this time of the year and in this scripture. And one of the absolutely astonishing, impossible claims of the Incarnation is that God literally walks with us, walks with us in Jesus Christ. And in this fourth week of Advent, now is the time for us to welcome again the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. To welcome this God who walks with us in all our struggles and griefs, to welcome this God who through Jesus Christ fully enters the world and anything that the world can throw at us. On this, the fourth Sunday of Advent, we, like Mary, can decide if we will welcome God, the coming one, into our heart. And if we will accept that gracious invitation and share with God our companion, the griefs, the sorrows, the joys of our lives. If the Christ is born in Bethlehem a million times and trudges the dusty roads of Palestine, preaching for a million years, but is not born in our heart and life, then what difference does the gospel make? But if you and I let the Christ enter in and live in us, then the good news is true. God is for us. God is with us. God is in us. God is among us. And we are thankful. God is with us. 
God is in us, and sorrow and sighing need be no more. And perhaps that is the greatest mystery of this day and the one that gives us the greatest joy. The angel's departing words to Mary were, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And so on this day, we echo faithful Mary's response, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your will. For love came down at Christmas. Incredible, impossible, but true. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing.